It is the first Sunday of the year, and I want to begin it right. So church, please turn with me in God's Word to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We are going to continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Exodus. And today we are going to do one whole entire verse. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. It is the third of the Ten Commandments. And the Word of God reads... You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, as I read that verse, I want you to ask you, how do you understand it? What does it mean to take God's name in vain? I believe that most of us would answer, and I've asked some people, I've already tried this poll, and I've gotten the same answer every time, so you may be different, but most people answer the question, well, that means you're not supposed to say certain curse words. Um, Yes, you should not say certain curse words, okay? Kids, don't misunderstand me this morning. Don't say those words that you know you're not supposed to say. And I do believe that doing so is violating the third commandment. But as I have studied this passage of Scripture, I have come to realize that is one tiny sliver of what the third commandment is about. So it's not wrong to say that the third commandment forbids us from using God's name as a curse word. It most certainly does. And and you were right to say that. But that is about 1% of what it is talking about, and we're missing the 99% of what the third commandment really means. And i got to be honest with you, as I prepared this sermon over the past few weeks, I, I knew that the third commandment was one of those I kind of always scratched my head at and felt like, I don't know that I fully understand what that one's about. I mean, I, I have a good idea, but I don't know if I fully understand what it's about. And as I studied it, and as I looked at how the rest of the Bible explains the third commandment, that you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, as I looked at how the other biblical authors explained it, I realized that I had missed what it was really saying. I want to tell you, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. What I mean by that is it's the... It's the Reformation principle. Back in the Protestant Reformation, those preachers who came in the 16th and 17th centuries out of the Protestant Reformation, they had a principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. Which means, if you want to understand a passage of Scripture, the first thing you should do is to look at what other passages of Scripture say about that passage. Right? So, for instance, a a good example, in in Genesis chapter 3, there's a snake in the garden, and that snake tempts Eve, who then leads Adam to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had forbidden them to eat from. Now, as we read that, nowhere in Genesis 3 is that serpent identified as Satan. But in Revelation chapter 12, John tells us the serpent in the garden was Satan. So we know that the serpent in the garden was Satan because John tells us that. Scripture interprets Scripture. So if we can look to a later passage of Scripture or within the book that we're reading to better understand what's happening here and what these words mean, then that is the first place that we need to begin. To, to begin. And so that's what I did. And as I begin to look at how the rest of the Bible explains the third commandment, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Up to this point in my life, I have not truly understood what it's about. It's not that I had gotten it wrong, I just didn't fully understand it. I had only understood a small part of what it meant. 
I also want to say that I am indebted to Vodi Bauckham, who, by the way, if you're just looking for a good preacher to listen to, Vodi Bauckham is a fantastic pastor. He used to pastor a church uh, near Houston, uh, but now uh, he leads a Baptist seminary in Zambia, Africa. Uh, but Vodi Bauckham uh, is uh, a fantastic preacher, and when he went through the Ten Commandments, I was greatly uh, blessed by his sermon just entitled The Third Commandment. And so some of the insights that I'm going to incorporate in the sermon today came from him. The majority of the insights come from just looking at how the other biblical authors explain the Third Commandment. I, would, I do want to begin by simply saying uh, that the Third Commandment... Um, it is helpful to be able to read the Hebrew language here. It's not necessary. But I do think that there is a hint at what it's really about in the Hebrew words that are used here. So in the first half of Exodus 20, verse 7, the ESV translation reads, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Literally, the Hebrew says, you shall not lift up or exalt the name of the Lord your God um, uselessly or worthlessly or falsely. That's what the, the Hebrew words literally mean. To, to take the name of God is, is, is a word, sana in Hebrew, that is primarily used of when you lift up God's name in worship. You praise His name. And so it's saying, do not lift up or exalt or praise His name falsely. That is literally what it means in the language that it was written by the prophet Moses. And, and I believe that indicates that it's about more than just saying curse words. Although saying curse words is breaking the third commandment. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's okay to do that. I'm saying, though, that the commandment is about falsely exalting God's name. Now, to explain what that means, I want to look at how other biblical authors comment on the third commandment because they will show us what it means to falsely exalt God's name, which is what the third commandment forbids. Turn with me, if you will, in God's Word to the book of Psalms, Psalm 139. And as we go to Psalm 139, we will be in verses 19 and 20. It's a beautiful psalm, and there is this portion at the end where, where the psalmist is, is, is professing his desire to follow God and obey God and how God knows everything about him. You knew me when you formed me in my mother's womb. And so the psalmist wants to live his life dedicated to the Lord, and then he contrasts a life of sincerity and desiring to follow the Lord with the wicked. And we read in Psalm 139, verse 19, Oh, that you, speaking to God, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent, your enemies take your name in vain. Now here is that reformation principle I'm talking about. In Psalm 139 verses 19 and 20, there's an explanation of what it means to take God's name in vain. You see that in the text, right? I want you to really see what I'm doing here because I want you to understand, as I might kind of revolutionize the way you look at the third commandment this morning, I want you to see that I am not making this up. It's coming straight out of these verses. It's coming out of the text of Scripture. He begins in verse 19 by saying, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. This is saying, God, bring justice against those who do evil. Men of blood, that speaks of those who commit acts of murder and violence. Depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies lift up your name falsely. It's the same Hebrew phrase from Exodus 20 verse 7. They, they lift up your name falsely. They take your name in vain. What is he saying? 
These are men who profess to be followers of the Lord. They profess to be believers. But the psalmist says in verse 20, they speak against you with malicious intent. Oh, they may say they love the Lord, but they know that their hearts are not right with God. They speak against God with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. These are men who claim to follow the Lord, and yet they commit violence and even murder. They are men of blood, the text says. And here's what it means to take God's name in vain, to find for us. It's a person who claims to be a Christian, who yet lives a life that denies the faith that they profess. They falsely exalt God's name. They claim to be a Christian, but they don't live like one. They claim to love the Lord, but they don't obey the Lord. They are exalting His name falsely. They are not what they profess to be. Now, if you go around using God's name as a curse word, you are certainly doing that. But you're also doing that anytime you claim to be a Christian and don't live a life that is in accord with the faith that you profess. I want to show you this as well in other portions of the Old Testament. The prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, he explains how Israel broke the third commandment. In Jeremiah, chapter 7, verses 9 through 15. And this is what God, through the prophet Jeremiah, says to the people of Israel at that time, or the people of Judah, more precisely, the southern portion of the kingdom of Israel, as he's speaking to the people of Judah, Jeremiah 7 verse 9, God says these words to the people, will you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? Now hold on, did you notice by the way what the prophet just did? Will you steal? Okay. Will you murder? Will you commit adultery? Will you swear falsely? Will you make offerings to Baal? Will you go after other gods? You notice where that list comes from, right? Those are from the Ten Commandments, every one of them. Will you break the Ten Commandments? And by the way, these are the very sins that the people of Judah, that God is speaking to through the prophet Jeremiah in these verses, they are committing these very acts. He's speaking to men who've actually committed murder and professed to be Christians. Men who've actually stolen and professed to be Christians. Men who've actually committed adultery and professed to be Christians. Who've sworn falsely. That that is falsely taken oath. By the way, that's another one of the Ten Commandments that we, we don't fully understand and we'll get there, what it means to swear falsely. But it's bigger than we often think, like... The third commandment is they, they, they make offerings to Baal and they go after other gods. So here we see listed among them the first, uh, the second, uh, the third, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth commandments. They're all breaking those, okay? Will you do these things, verse 10, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say, we are delivered only to go on doing all these abominations? So are you going to break more than half of the Ten Commandments and then come to church and say, oh, I love the Lord. He's so good to me. Oh, He's just going to bless you. Oh, He's just so good to you. And you're speaking as someone who has broken all of these commandments and you have no repentance and no remorse over the abominations in your life. Verse 11, God asks this question, Has this house, which is called by my name, don't miss that, God's house, the temple in Jerusalem, is called by His name. He's invoking the third commandment. Do not exalt my name falsely. Don't proclaim to be my child if you're not going to live like it. That's what he's saying. 
Because the people who come into my house and worship me, I expect them to obey me. So he says, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? By the way, do you remember anybody in the New Testament who referenced this verse? When he was flipping over tables in the temple and hitting people with whips? And Jesus said, The Scripture says, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves and robbers. What was Jesus saying when he did that? He's saying you've broken the third commandment. You claim to be worshiping me, but you're worshiping money and yourselves. You are swearing, you, you, you are exalting my name falsely. Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Continuing in Jeremiah 7, verse 12. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh. This is where they first worshiped the Lord. So he's saying, go back to the, the purity of worship, right? S stop it with all your false worship. And get a pure heart and, and worship me sincerely. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh where I made my name dwell at first and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now because you've done all these things, declares the Lord, when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen. And when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore I will do to the house that is called by my name. Notice, once again, God invokes His name. I will, I will do to the house that is called by my name, in which you trust, to the place that I gave to you and your fathers as I did to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I will cast out all your kinsmen and all the offspring of Ephraim. It's just like Jesus in Matthew 7 when He says, Many will say to Me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and do many mighty miracles in your name? And I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now what do they say? We prophesied in your name. We did mighty miracles in your name. What is it about the name of God? The name of God, Yahweh in Hebrew, the name of God is attached to the very character of God. That He is holy, He is righteous, He is good, He is pure, He is true. The name of God reminds us that we have a God who is perfect, good, holy, and righteous. And when we swear, when we, uh, excuse me, exalt His name falsely, when we exalt His name falsely, we are not representing Him rightly. We're saying we believe in worship and follow the God who is holy, righteous, and true, and yet we are living lives that are false, unrighteous, and wicked. And if you are claiming to follow the Lord, and you are exalting His, your, His name, but you do so falsely, you're breaking the third commandment. I entitled the sermon this morning, you take God's name in vain more than you think. Anytime you misrepresent God, anytime you claim to follow Him and you do not live in accord with the faith that you profess, you are breaking the third commandment. And brothers and sisters, if we're honest with ourselves, we have done this many times. You see, the, the problem is, we often think of the third commandment and we might not do it intentionally, but this is what happens. We think of it legalistically. What do I mean by legalistic? That there's a technical rule that you can't violate. Just don't say this phrase, right? And I don't need to say it. You know what the phrases are. Maybe more colloquially, don't say OMG. That's one way of using God's name as a curse word. There are other more vile ways. I won't. Cite those, you know what they are, but let's just say OMG. Should you say that? No, you shouldn't. Because you should never use God's name as a curse word. And if you do that, then you are breaking the third commandment. But brothers and sisters, the third commandment is a matter of the heart. It's not just a matter of, the, of a specific phrase that you cannot say. Don't say these words 
and you're good, right? So if you come to the third commandment and you say, well, you know, I don't use God's name as a curse word. Therefore, I've not broken the third commandment. If you do that, you're a legalist. And you don't see that you have exalted God's name falsely. You have professed to be a follower of God and not lived that in your daily life. And what you don't realize is, is that you've broken His commands and you think you're right with God. This was how the Pharisees operated in the New Testament. They, they thought they were righteous before God. And Jesus said, you brood of vipers. You are so wicked and you think you're righteous. Legalism establishes these nice, neat little rules. And if I just don't break these rules, then I'm good. I'm a, I'm a good person. If I just go to church... If, if I just pray my prayers, if I give my tithe, if I read my Bible, if I don't say these words, if I do this and don't do that, then I'm good with God. All the while, your heart is not sincere. That is what it means to exalt God's name falsely, to take God's name in vain. Let's continue and look at how the biblical authors reference the third commandment. We see in Jeremiah 19, Jeremiah 19, verses 8 and 9. Jeremiah 19, verse 8, And I will make this city a horror. God's speaking about how He's going to bring judgment against Jerusalem. A thing to be hiss that. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of all of its wounds and I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters and everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with the enemies with which those who seek their life afflict them. As we, as we look at how the people in this time we're disobeying the Lord. God says, I will make them a whore. They name my name. They claim to follow me, but they do so falsely. We go on to Matthew chapter 6. And I notice this in, I notice this in the phrase. You all know this verse. It's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6 verse 9. And as I reference this, I think I finally understand what Jesus is saying. This is also another one of those verses that when I read it, I thought, hmm, what, what does Jesus really mean by this phrase? Matthew 6, verse 9, you know it. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now the word there to hallow is to make holy, to sanctify your name. To make holy is to be righteous. But I noticed that this is not a request that God would hallow His own name. The Greek verb here is not a second person singular. God, you do this. That's not what it says. But the, the verb is a third person singular. God, may your name be kept holy. That's what it's saying. God, may your name be kept holy. Well, what is... What is Jesus teaching us to pray? God, don't make me bring shame on your name by the way that I live. God, may your name be kept holy. By who? By me and all those who name your name. It's not a request that God would keep His own name holy. Believe me, He's more than capable of doing that. It's a request that I wouldn't bring shame and reproach upon the name of God. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. It means, God, don't let me misrepresent you. Don't let me be a hypocrite and bring shame and reproach on your name. And then in Matthew 15, verses 7 and 9. Matthew 15, verses 7 and 9. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees with these words. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, 
This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Do you see what Jesus is doing there in verse 9? He's invoking the third commandment. In vain do they worship me. Where did he get that language from? He got it from Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And Jesus is here explaining that the Pharisees regularly break the third commandment. They take God's name in vain. How do they do it? Verse 8, they do it because they honor God with their lips. Oh, they sing praises to God and talk about how they love Him, but their heart is far from Him. In vain do they worship Me. Teaching is doctrines, the commandments of men. They, they, they made all these rules that were outside of Scripture. Rather than teaching the Scripture, they made up their own legalistic rules. It's funny because the very legalism that they were committing is the kind of legalism that the third commandment is forbidding and they think they're keeping it by being legalistic. Now if you can't follow that mess, that's okay, but it's the irony of it. The third commandment is telling them to not do the very thing that they're doing and thinking they're keeping the third commandment. And so, we see here in the scriptures a, a, a biblical commentary on Exodus 20 verse 7. And we are told that God destroyed the ancient city of Jerusalem for breaking the third commandment. And we are warned here in Exodus 20 verse 7, if we go back to the verse, it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Or literally, you shall not exalt God's name falsely. And then there's a warning. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes His name in vain. What did Jesus say to those who said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and cast out many demons in Your name and do many mighty works in Your name? He says, and I will say to them, depart from Me, I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness. What do we see in Matthew chapter 25 when He separates the sheep and the goats. The sheep go to eternal life. The goats, who named His name, He casts them into the lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is the warning in verse 7 for those who take God's name in vain? The one who takes God's name in vain is the person who is falsely professing to be a follower of the Lord. And we are told the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In other words, it's not good enough to call yourself a Christian. You've actually got to be one. It's not good enough just to name the name of Jesus Christ. You actually have to follow Jesus Christ. Your works will not save you. The words that come out of your mouth will not save you. It is the faith that is given in your heart that saves you. We have people who believe that they're going to heaven because once in their life they came forward in a church service and prayed the sinner's prayer. And many of us were saved in a moment like that. But let me tell you something. Not everyone who has prayed the sinner's prayer will be saved on the last day. Why am I saying that? Because you can mouth those words and not mean them in your heart. You can say the words and they mean nothing to you. You see, it's legalism to think, well, if I just repeat this incantation, then I'm going to heaven. Brothers and sisters, Christianity is not like witchcraft. We don't repeat a magical incantation and then, boom, our soul is saved. No, there is faith in the heart and the sinner's prayer, which is right to use, should be an expression of my desire to repent of my sins and follow Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. Lord, come into my life. Lord, help me to follow You. Lord, I give my life to You. And if you pray that and mean it in your heart, then yes, you are saved. But you're not saved because you repeated those words. A parrot can do that. 
You're saved because you meant it in your heart. You're not a person like in Isaiah, excuse me, Matthew 15, verse 8, who honors God with your lips, but your heart is far from Him. You're a person who honors God with your lips because your heart is near Him and you mean what you say. So don't exalt God's name falsely. Don't take God's name in vain. When you come to church and you sing those hymns, mean it. Sing those hymns from the bottom of your heart. And brothers, sisters, if you don't mean it, why sing it? Right? When you read God's Word, don't just read it. Believe it. And then live by it. Christianity is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of, of, of God changing you and me from the inside out. And the third commandment is saying, don't think that you're going to heaven just because you did the right things or said the right words. You're not going to heaven unless your heart belongs to God. That's what the third commandment is about. And I'm going to be honest with you. Up until a few weeks ago, I had missed it. I had missed it. And I have to say, this is why I preach through books of the Bible. Because I've been studying the Bible for a long time. Some of you much longer than me, but... I've been studying the Bible a lot, and I have to say, in preparing this sermon, I learned a lot that I had heretofore missed. And i got to tell you, the Word of God is indeed living and active sharper than any double-edged sword. And I pray that God has shown this to you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we, we come before you this morning, God, and we confess our sin. And Lord, we confess we've often broken the third commandment. We, we often say things that we don't really mean. And God, may our worship never be like that. May we worship you not only with our lips, but with our hearts that all of our souls would be wrapped up in the songs we sing and the word that is read and preached and the prayers we pray. Lord, may we worship you from the bottom of our hearts. Forgive us when we've broken this commandment. Lord, if there's one here today who recognizes that I am that person who's exalted God's name falsely, I claim to follow Him, but I never truly knew Him. And God, I pray that right now that that, that man or woman, that boy or girl would, would repent. That, that, that you would grant them the gift of faith that they would truly with all of their heart place their faith in Jesus Christ to follow Him. And I pray that they would have the courage to even come before this church family now and to make their desire to follow Christ known in this time of invitation. God, would you move in our hearts that we would worship you in spirit and in truth as the Lord Jesus told us we must do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.